The next presentation is about res judicata in Chinese arbitration. You can see uh, Patrick and Charles on your screen. They're from Lynx Law Offices. Uh, Patrick and Charles have uh, presented in some of the in-house community events, online events previously. So welcome again, both of you. Um, a little uh, short introduction. Uh, Charles is a partner of Lynx Law Offices. He's been practicing for the past three decades with rich experience in banking, corporate finance, uh, private equity, venture capital, and asset management. Uh, he shifted his practice from transactions to dispute resolution about 12 years ago. Uh, in addition to counsel and arbitrator work, he's also acted as PRC law expert witness before foreign courts or international arbitration, arbitral tribunals in more than 10 cases. He's currently a panel arbitrator of SCIA, SHIAC, and SAC. Uh, he's a member of Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, and he's also on Shanghai Municipal Lecturer Mission to give lectures uh, on the PRC Civil Code. Thank you so much, Charles. And Patrick has more than 20 years experience in cross-border dispute resolution, including international arbitration and litigation. Uh, before joining Lynx, he worked 12 years in a couple of leading law firms in the U.S. Uh, and China, including a senior consultant at Herbert Smith uh, and partner at Clifford Chance, and managing partner at Beijing office of Clyde & Co. Uh, before that, he had worked at CTAC uh, for eight years, and he's qualified to practice law both in China and the New York State. So thank you very much, uh, Patrick, for joining us as well. Now it's over to you. Please uh, start your presentation. Thank you, thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you, uh, in our committee for inviting us to this conference, uh, this e Congress uh, 2021, Hong Kong. And we are greatly honored and privileged. Uh, the topic we want to address today is a res judicata in Chinese arbitration. And uh, this issue might be one of the most complicated legal issues in Chinese arbitration. And also, uh, there are a lot of unsettled uh, issues uh, making Chinese arbitration or litigation uh, somewhat different from Hong Kong or other jurisdictions. Uh, uh, there are many, many cases actually uh, re-arbitrated or re-litigated, and uh, the same uh, issues are, are denied by the second tribunal, uh, it, uh, the issue has already been adjudicated and ascertained by the first tribunal uh, might be uh, denied or overruled by the second tribunal. Uh, we will address all these issues today in the next one hour. Uh, I will skip uh, introduction to uh, Charles and, I, and myself, and I just briefly introduce our law firm and Airlinx uh, law offices uh, was established in 1998, and uh, we are a full service law firm, and we are uh, one of the leading law firms in China, and having strong uh, practice areas uh, and expertise in asset management, financial services, capital markets, corporate investment, and M&A, and also uh, dispute resolution. And we have done quite many cases uh, in transnational litigation and international arbitration uh, in various venues, uh, including HKIC, SCC, ICC, and many others, and of course, uh, CTEC and Beijing Arbitration Commission. So uh, let me start with a general overview of the, this, today's discussion. The, I will, uh, Charles and I will address the following for uh, issues. And we will briefly introduce uh, what is res judicata and doctrines of res judicata and also the triple identity test under Chinese law. And we also present uh, case law uh, with regard to res judicata in Chinese arbitration and also litigation. Uh, what is res judicata? Res judicata means a thing adjudicated. Uh, in Chinese terms, we say as yi uh, si bu zai li, that is exactly the same uh, with res judicata, the English meaning of res judicata, which means that a thing 
having been adjudicated cannot be re-adjudicated or re-heard again. But in Chinese law, we normally we do not use res judicata. We use a, a avoidance of repeated, repeated uh, litigation or repeated arbitration, uh, but uh, with the same meaning or with the same kind of attentions. And the res judicata means that once a judicial decision has been made by court or any other competent tribunal, which has jurisdiction over the same subject matter over the same parties, and uh, which disposes the matters in controversy finally and conclusively. Then, other than appeal, the subject matter cannot be re-litigated or re-arbitrated or re-heard or re-adjudicated between the same parties and their previous. Uh, this is a common law notion of res judicata. And there are mainly uh, four issues, four doctrines. The first one is cause, cause of action estoppel, which means that once a claim arising out of a cause of action has been adjudicated, you cannot raise any other claim arising out of the same cause of action. And the second one is issue estoppel, which means that once an issue, either factual or legal, or a mixture of factual and legal, it has been decided by the first tribunal, then the second tribunal hearing the same issue cannot overrule or issue any ruling in contradiction to the first tribunal's decision on the issue. And the third principle is called a formal recovery, and we will discuss uh, in conjunction with Chinese uh, practice. Uh, formal recovery means that, for example, that if you have raised a claim amounting to 1 million US dollars, then as a winning party, you cannot raise another claim in the separate arbitration or litigation that you want to uh, claim seek. Uh, another separate $1 million, even your loss uh, is more than $2 million US dollars uh, because of uh, the principle of formal recovery. And there is also an extended doctrine of res judicata as uh, normally known as Henderson versus Henderson doctrine. Uh, it is also, also called the abuse of process, which means that uh, any claim which could be could have been raised in the first litigation arbitration or should have been raised in the first litigation arbitration cannot be raised again in the second arbitration or litigation. Uh, this is a notion, abuse of process, has special bearing, has special importance in Chinese law today because, as I mentioned before, that there are a lot of cases actually are uh, re-litigated and re-arbitrated arising uh, on the claim arising out of the same cause of action between the same parties. The civil law jurisdictions commonly adopted a triple identity test, which has been adopted by Chinese law, which means that there are three requirements in, in order to apply, in order to uh, 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 make any arbitration litigation with the kata. Uh, the first one is uh, identity of parties, and the second one is identity of cause. But cause uh, means a uh, cause of action, or in Chinese terms, a uh, subject matter. And Chinese law students, at least at the uh, their beginning, in their beginning of their legal training, uh, have always been uh, confused. Uh, what does uh, uh, cause mean, actually? In Chinese, we call it biao uh, di. And uh, uh, you have to make clear that the cause means legal rule or principle on which a party's claim is based, or a set of 
facts supporting a claim or giving rise to dispute or giving rise to a claim. Uh, this uh, has significant implications on the application of res judicata, particularly in China. And also there should be identity of object. Object means the thing claimed. So normally we say it's claim of litigation or arbitration. And Charles and I will give you more details uh, later. Uh, adopting the common law uh, 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 practice that we I like to begin with the conclusion rather than uh, leaving this conclusion to the end of this presentation that what are the key characteristics of res judicata in Chinese arbitration? Uh, because there are China applies strict uh, triple identity test. So although among the three identity tests, uh, uh, three identities, uh, the second one is cause. Uh, but because all three uh, criteria should be identical in order for res judicata to apply. So there is no uh, strict cause of action stop under the Chinese law. And also the subject matter, uh, the notion of subject matter is unclear in the res judicata contest. Uh, we will discuss this later also. And also uh, more important is that issue stop uh, yet to be established. Uh, because the, the second tribunal quite often uh, overrule the, set, the first tribunal's decision on fact or on law or on the mixture of uh, law and fact. And also uh, equally important one is abuse of process not yet established. Again, there are many claims splitting. Uh, we, we, I want to say that uh, Formal, formal recovery uh, might be uh, uh, forbidden uh, under Chinese law. I will give you a, a case uh, case law uh, uh, in, in the next uh, in my, in my in my next uh, slide. But uh, with reference to uh, different types of claims, a uh, claim splitting is norm. So, for example, that if you have five different claims then you can, at least theoretically, you are allowed to raise five arbitrations and the same arbitration agreement, of course, arising out of the same cause of action and between the same parties. Uh, and also in China, we do not have res judicata in arbitration, this uh, special regime. Even the proposal made by the Ministry of Justice recently um, the amendment of Chinese arbitration law, uh, res judicata has not uh, only uh, has not been made uh, much amendment. Uh, uh, the Chinese arbitration law says, Article 9 says, re-arbitration is not allowed, but uh, no criteria, no specific criteria about arbit uh, res judicata and arbitration have been uh, proposed. So, uh, and uh, this, uh, 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 and the Chinese practice, res judicata in litigation, which uh, was a, a defined in civil procedural law and the Chinese uh, Supreme People's Court's interpretation on civil procedural law will apply to arbitration. Uh, Chinese law has adopted a triple identity test. So, uh, which requires uh, identity of parties, identity of, I say, so uh, we are still not very clear what PLD means, which means legal relation or any or a set of facts giving rise to claim. And also, as it is, the third one is identity of claims. So, if, if as I said, that if you have uh, multiple claims, then you can raise multiple litigation and arbitration. But uh, also, uh, there's an important, uh, uh, important factor in, uh, in res judicata that uh, new facts, uh, if, if there are uh, new facts after the, after the award or judgment has been 
made, then the occurrence of new facts uh, will, will give rise to new cause of action, and uh, the parties can uh, raise, uh, can commence arbitration or litigation on that cause, a new cause of action. So let me uh, briefly introduce what does identity of parties mean? Actually, uh, the, uh, the first one is that the, uh, both parties' position in the previous arbitration litigation uh, will, will, will not make them that uh, they are not identical. They, they, even the plaintiff becomes respondent, uh, defendant, or defendant becomes plaintiff, then they are the same parties. And uh, this is very clear and identical, uh, very similar to uh, common law uh, and civil law uh, jurisdictions. And successors are also regarded as identical parties. And uh, shareholders sometimes are also regarded as identical parties. And also assignees are also are regarded as identical parties. So that uh, the F triple, triple identity test has been met, then uh, risk judicata uh, will Will, will bar the claimant uh, raise uh, that litigation arbitration. arbitration. Uh, and the, the, uh, the notion of previous uh, is still not very clear. And so uh, a, a course will define uh, the notion of previous uh, on a case by a case basis. And the second uh, criteria uh, is identity of cause of action. Again, uh, there is actually the notion of a cause of action. We say su yo uh, is uh, more than 400, 400 causes of action uh, available in civil procedure. And uh, you have to find out uh, at least the one cause of action before you're commencing litigation. Uh, but a, but a, in, in the context of res judicata, uh, we use, uh, Chinese law use a uh, subject to matter. Uh, again, we have to make it clear whether this is a legal ground or a factual ground. And in this case, uh, the, uh, the, the court said, the subject to matter as a legal relation in disputes to be decided by the court. So uh, this has a, a significant impact on um, um, on the application of Rishikata because on the same facts, on the basis of same facts giving rise to the uh, same plan between the same parties, the party, uh, the, uh, one of the parties may rely on a legal relationship, for example, contractual relationship. And then if he fails, then he can change uh, the cause of action. And then saying that this is a tortious claim. Uh, Chinese law uh, is not very clear about, about this, but many courts say that uh, in, in such circumstances that uh, res judicata may bar uh, the second, uh, second cause of action. Uh, but but uh, in this case, the, the court said the subsequent matter is legal relation. Uh, and in, in, in in the next case, the court said that the disputed behaviors, the disputed behaviors means that the facts rather than, rather than legal issues. The disputed behaviors means that uh, the, the, the facts giving rise to the claim are the same. So in this case, the court seems to say that uh, subject matter or cause of action as a factual issue rather than a legal issue. Uh, and uh, the, the third one is identity of claims. And uh, uh, in China, uh, as, uh, as many other jurisdictions, that there are uh, such types of uh, claims, a declaratory relief, a specific performance, injunctive relief, uh, damages, and liquidated damages, interest or termination of a contract. 
uh, there are numerous cases on termination of contracts. Uh, and also uh, in terms of damages, can be, uh, uh, damages can be further classified as reliance interest, expectation interest, and the restitutionary interest. And all these claims, uh, if, you ha uh, if the claimant has not raised in the first arbitration, then uh, he or she can raise in the second arbitration. So this is split up claim, split, uh, cl uh, claim splitting uh, is known uh, in Chinese arbitration and the litigation. Uh, Charles will give you more example, uh, which uh, the case uh, which uh, we at the Erlings team has, has represented uh, before CTEC. Uh, I think, uh, so in the first case, actually, uh, we, uh, we claimed reliance interest and uh, restitutional interest, and restitutionary interest. And then we raised the second arbitration claiming for expectation interest. Uh, uh, this is a Chinese practice. Uh, so, uh, Again, uh, this, uh, in, order, in order for uh, uh, risk to cut out to, uh, to, be, uh, to work, uh, you, you have to prove identity of, of claims. And, and this one is, is quite uh, unique that the first, in the first case, uh, the case is about uh, the validity of the contract. And then the second case, the cause of action is that to declare is declaratory relief, declare invalidity of contract. And the court said they are the basic, they are basically the same. So uh, the, uh, the, the, the judgment has, uh, has reached Jakarta effect. Uh, and in this case, uh, the, uh, the, the court uh, rendered a different uh, decision that because in the first case, the, the court, the claim is the actual construction cost. And in the second case is a, the, while a, the shareholder's violation of shareholder's obligation causing, causing loss uh, by the claimant. So the court said they are different. Uh, they are not identical. So they, uh, they, do not, they are not rich to cut out. So, and in this case, uh, interest and the principle are regarded as separate claims. Again, because in the first case, the claimant uh, had uh, raised principal claim. And then in the second case, the, 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 uh, the claimant again raised interest claim. And uh, uh, the court said, because the, claim, the claims are different. So they are not identical. Uh, so there is no any, uh, there's no uh, re-arbitration or repeated uh, litigation, sorry. But uh, there's an interesting case. Uh, this is very useful that although claim splitting is allowed and is known, but unfortunately, uh, there's a similar notion of formal recovery because you cannot split your, for example, monetary claim, you, if you have a 100 million uh, US dollar claim for, claim, for example, you cannot claim it into 100 arbitrations or litigations by claiming only uh, 1 million, for example, each in, uh, in each of the 100 litigations or arbitrations. So, and uh, the court used a very similar notion uh, with English law that this is a waste and abuse of litigation resources. It is very similar to abuse of process. And under Chinese law, uh, uh, coming back to uh, in Chinese arbitration, that what is the consequence or what is the ground for uh, setting aside an award uh, because of a violation of uh, so uh, I will uh, introduce uh, the first uh, issue, that first limb, 
this is an interesting case uh, rendered by uh, CICC, a Chinese international uh, commercial court uh, in 2019, that a, a, the first one is tri arbitral tribunal is not empowered to arbitrate matters. Uh, uh, this is a, a quite, uh, so the arbitral awards shall be set aside and shall not be enforced. I will uh, give you more details uh, uh, later. Uh, and uh, Charles will further give you introductions uh, on uh, Chinese courts normally they consider whether they should intervene, for example, whether they should reopen the case, whether they should revisit the case uh, for, for their judicial review, uh, for setting aside or announcement proceedings. And one of the most important issues is that you have to identify first whether res judicata is procedural issues or purely substantive issues. Uh, in, the in the latter case, the courts are reluctant or they are not empowered to intervene. Uh, so this is a uh, quite uh, well-known case, as quite a recent case. Uh, in this case, uh, there are two arbitrations. There are two CTEC arbitrations. And uh, in the first arbitration, uh, the, uh, it's between UNIPTOP and the SIPC. SIPC, the uh, leading subsidiary of Sinopec. And the SIPC uh, uh, entrusted uh, UNITOP to do some business uh, in Kazakhstan and, uh, and it's, uh, uh, entering into an uh, agency agreement, but SIPC refused to pay uh, the, uh, the commission, uh, which is uh, the, the amount is quite huge. And uh, the uh, unit top uh, uh, commenced an arbitration against the SIPC. And then the first uh, CTEC award, uh, in the first CTEC award, Clement's uh, claim was uh, dismissed. And then uh, two years later, almost two years later, the claimant commenced the second CTEC arbitration on the same cause of action, of course, uh, between the same parties and also uh, the same claim. But, uh, but in the second arbitration, uh, because the tribunal said that because the second arbitration is based on the new cause of action or a different cause of action because, because of new facts which occurred after the first arbitral award. So in this case, uh, the, the tribunal rendered an award uh, in uh, UNITOP's favor. And then uh, SIPC uh, went to Beijing Force Intermediate Court for judicial review uh, on the basis of uh, violation of, uh, we say that uh, uh, final adjudication principle under Article 9 of Chinese arbitration law. So uh, that's a very interesting point uh, because uh, what does final education mean? And we, the, the ruling is that uh, the, uh, in, in this, uh, let me just introduce uh, the ruling of uh, the, the award of C, in the, in the second award of CTEC that although the part is the same, the subject matter of the dispute are the same and the claims are the same because the second arbitration it was based on new facts, uh, new facts. So uh, there is no issue of repeated arbitration or res judicata issue. In other words, there was no violation of Article 9 of Chinese arbitration law, a final adjudication principle. But the uh, but the Supreme People's uh, Court, uh, uh, they they, ran, uh, they, uh, they thought the other way around, uh, because uh, under internal review process, uh, this this decision was finally uh, approved, uh, endorsed by the Supreme People's Court. 
And uh, you can find this quite interesting, how Chinese courts, how Chinese judges, or Chinese arbitrators consider this judicata issue. Again, because there is no uh, very clear notion of cause of action estoppel, and there is no clear notion of issue estoppel, and there is no uh, notion of abuse of process. So uh, even under uh, US law, uh, like a pre claim preclusion or issue a preclusion or collateral estoppel, all these notions are lacking. So uh, judges have no way, and also the arbitrators also have no way uh, to give a proper consideration on these issues. So you can find that uh, the judges said that because the, the new facts have no relevance because the, the, the so-called new facts have not generated rights and obligations. Uh, I have no idea where uh, this, uh, this rationale uh, 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 comes from because obviously the judge is, uh, is making a new law, uh, giving, uh, uh, in giving a new interpretation on what constitutes a new facts. But actually, uh, because they have no any idea that how uh, to apply a uh, cause of action estoppel. So probably uh, if English judge decides this case, they can, uh, he or she, uh, the judge can say that uh, because the, the claim uh, was, the, uh, the, the claim arose out of the same cause of action and, uh, uh, and the issues decided by the first tribunal cannot be uh, overruled. And actually we, I know the, 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 the two, award, I, I read the two words, actually in the second award, a lot of legal issues, like identification of facts and application of law or interpretation of Chinese law actually have been overruled or denied uh, by, by the second tribunal. So uh, the last point is that I, I actually, the judge said, because uh, there, is, there was a first award. So the second tribunal has no power, had, had no power to arbitrate the subject matter. Uh, with due respect, I have to say that uh, uh, maybe there was some confusion between uh, the power of arbitrate, uh, the power to arbitrate. Actually, the power of arbitration uh, should, be, uh, should be interpreted as uh, arbitrability issue. You know, only some, some, some disputes can only be litigated and it cannot be arbitrated. Uh, that should be the reason, uh, the, the meaning, uh, and the Chinese arbitration law uh, in Article 58. Uh, but the judge said uh, they used this uh, clause, uh, which, uh, which is used, uh, which uh, is supposed to, to be applied in annulment proceedings because the tribunal has arbitrated something in arbitrable dispute, for example, the validity of the parent. But, but the judge said uh, used that annulment ground in res judicata uh, contest. And I said, because you, uh, the, the, the first award has been rendered. So the tribunal has no power to adjudicate the second arbitration, the second uh, 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 arbitration. So there is, a, I, I think, a, a, in other words, that we, we, we still have a long way to go uh, to clarify this issue uh, and the rich Dakota. And actually, lawyers are utilizing the Chinese uh, rich Dakota regime. As Charles, Charles will introduce you further, that how our law firm has uh, uh, utilized our, uh, our rich Dakota regime and uh, uh, brought uh, the best interest to our clients. 
Uh, thank you very much. I will hand, uh, hand over to, to Charles. Uh, Charles, please. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, thanks, everyone. I would like to um, share with you some uh, real cases in China, including a recent case in which a Lynx team led by Patrick and me, myself, uh, we represent one of the parties to, uh, to CTEC arbitration uh, proceedings. The first case I'd like to share with you is um, the case between Coop Company, Coop Tianjin Business, and the Tianjin Nanshi Food Street Management. The, dis the dispute arose from a corporation agreement. One of the parties to the corporation agreement, Coop Company, initiated three arbitrations in total. In the first arbitration, Coop Company requested for a declaratory relief that the other party had an obligation to transfer the ownership of the building rather than the right, of, the right to use the building. And uh, Coop Company won the first case. In the second arbitration, Coop Company requested for a separate declaratory relief that Nanshu, the counterparty, failed to fully perform its obligations of capital contribution. Coop Company won again. And then Coop Company initiated the third arbitration and requested the counterparty to perform its obligation of capital contribution and a liquidated damages of roughly Renminbi 15 million. Unfortunately, Coop Company failed in its third arbitration against Nanshu Committee. Afterwards, Coop Company filed an application for setting aside the last or the third arbitral award. So those three arbitral proceedings illustrated that in practice in China, claim splitting is very popular, which you have already heard from uh, Patrick during his presentation. The Beijing number four intermediate court found that the third arbitral award is in conflict with the second arbitral award. So the Beijing number four intermediate court held that the third arbitral award should be set aside. But when the appeal court, Beijing High Court, revisited the issue, Beijing High Court held that res judicata is a substantive issue rather than a procedure issue. And res judicata falls within the jurisdiction of the relevant arbitral tribunals. So finally, the verdict of Beijing 4 was overturned by Beijing High Court. The second case I'd like to share with you is Xu against the Xu. To Mr. Xu, um, Xu Jianchong and Xu Jianguo, they made an equity transfer agreement and Xu Jianguo initiated the first arbitration and requested Xu Jianchong to pay the share purchase price. Afterwards, Xu Jianguo initiated the second arbitration and requested for overdue interest arising from Xu Jianchong's delay in payment. And then Xu Jianchong respondents in the previous two arbitrations initiated the third arbitration and requested compensation for the cost of his vehicle and interest, saying the vehicle was wrongfully counted as a company's asset by the first arbitral award. Afterwards, Xu Jianguo initiated the last or the fourth arbitration and requested compensation for breach of contract. 
we call it damages. Xu Jianguo then filed an application for setting aside the last arbitral word because Xu Jianguo was the losing party in the fourth arbitration proceedings. So this case also illustrated how popular claim splitting is in practice in China. When Shanghai number one intermediate court was reviewing the issues, the judges of Shanghai number one intermediate court, unlike the judges of Beijing number four intermediate court, the Shanghai judge held that res judicata is a procedure matter and the violation of res judicata could amount to a procedural irregularity. So it is very interesting that the judges of Beijing number four and the judges of Shanghai um, number one are of different opinions. And in the case before Shanghai number one, the judges held that because new facts occurred after the first arbitral award was rendered, an application for the second arbit arbitration based on the new facts will not be considered as in violation of the doctrine of res judicata. Therefore, the claimant's argument that the arbitration procedure was not in conformity with the statutory procedure could not be upheld. The third case I'd like to share with you are disputes arising from a collaboration agreement. A Chinese party and a foreign party entered into a collaboration agreement several years ago, and disputes arose from that uh, collaboration uh, agreement. In that case, a Lynx team led by uh, Patrick and me uh, acted for the foreign entity, which is the party to the collaboration agreement. The Chinese entity actually holds um, the minority shares in the joint venture. The foreign entity held uh, majority shares in the joint venture. The joint venture was established for the purpose of providing some professional services. And the joint venture was supposed to be managed and operated by the foreign entity, while the Chinese entity promised to provide a site for the business operations of the JV. And uh, the foreign entity could charge management fees, which are equivalent to a substantial part of the revenue of the JV. Unfortunately, the Chinese party refused to perform its obligations under the collaboration agreement after it obtained the administration license from the relevant government authority with the great help and efforts of the foreign entity. It is very interesting that in that particular area, the joint venture itself is not qualified to obtain the business license. Only a, a Chinese entity, only the Chinese entity or purely 100%, uh, an entity 100% invest by uh, Chinese parties who are qualified to acquire the relevant administrative license. We assisted the foreign party to launch two arbitration proceedings before CTEC. In the first arbitration proceeding, we assisted our client to claim for first, termination of the collaboration agreement. And second, a client claimed for valuation of the administrative license. And thirdly, a client claimed for actual loss in the first arbitration case. Our team argued that the administrative approval is extremely valuable. And that our client actually made a huge effort to help the Chinese entity obtain the license. And after the agreement terminated, it is likely that the respondent could still make huge profits by utilizing the license. 
eventually, the arbitral tribunal of CTEC upheld a client's claims. And then we assisted a client to launch the second arbitration proceedings before CTEC. In the second case, a client claimed for loss of management fees or profits. During the hearing of the second proceedings, the Chinese entity argued that the claimant or a client violated the doctrine of res judicata, saying the value of administrative license has already been covered uh, in the loss of management, has already covered the loss of management fees. Our team rebutted during the second arbitral proceedings that our client claimed for different things on different legal basis in both proceedings. In the first arbitration case, our claims was based on actual loss, which is also known as reliance interest. And in the first case, we also claimed for restitution institute or disgorgement of institute. While in the second arbitration, our client claimed for expectation interest. So it is clear that our client's claims in both arbitrations are based on different types of losses or interest and different legal basis. Therefore, we did not violate the principle of non-double adjudication or res judicata. The second arbitral tribunal eventually held that whether the application for the second arbitration violates the rule of res judicata is a substantive issue, not a procedure issue, it's a substantive issue. And this issue could be resolved in its arbitral award. And the second tribunal held that the value of license was in the nature of property rights, while the loss of management fees were the distribution of the JV's income. Therefore, the principle of double adjudication was not violated. So finally, the second tribunal upheld a client's claim for management fees in the second arbitral proceedings. We know that it's very popular for judges and tribunals to upheld um, disgorgement of interest or restitution interest in tortious claims. But it is rare for arbitral tribunals or court of justices to upheld restitution interest in contractual claims. The next case I'd like to share with you um, is between a Chinese company called Herbei ZX Auto and a foreign company called Automotive, Automotive Gate. In this case, we can find that a declaratory relief by a mainland court that arbitration agreement is, is invalid could have the effect of res judicata. The disputes arose from an arbitration agreement and an agency agreement and a technological cooperation agreement. In year 2015, Automotive initiated arbitration before ICC Court of Arbitration. And afterwards, the respondent, the Herbie Company, brought a case before Si Jiazhuang Intermediate Court. The claim is for the court to um, confirm that the arbitration agreement was invalid. The Chinese party won its case before the Si Jiazhuang Intermediate Court. And after that, Automotive Gate won a partial award rendered by the ICC Tribunal. Automotive Gate applied for recognition and enforcement of that award before another Chinese court, that is Yichang Intermediate Court. The judges of the second Chinese court, Yichang Intermediate Court, held that when the People's Court or the Shi Jiazhuang Court had invalidated the arbitration agreement, 
the recognition and enforcement of an award based on that invalid arbitration agreement would and could conflict with the previous PRC court decision and thereby contravening the public interest in China. The claims of Automotive Gate was dismissed by Yichang Intermediate Court. The next case, which has been heard by Taichou Intermediate Court, is very similar to the previous case. After an arbitration had been initiated before ICC Court of Arbitration, the Chinese party launched a lawsuit before the People's Court in Jiangsu province. And eventually, the Jiangsu High Court held that um, the arbitration agreement in question was invalid. And after the foreign party had won an award from the ICC Arbitral Tribunal, the second Chinese court, the Taichu Intermediate Court, held that the ICC award could not be recognized and enforced because otherwise it will um, contravene the public policy in China. So these are the cases I'd like to share with you. If anyone has any questions, Patrick and me would like to uh, answer those questions. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you very much, Charles and, uh, and and Patrick. Thank you very much for your in informative uh, uh, presentation, including all these examples and case studies. Very informative. Uh, we've shared your details, both your details in the chat box. I, I am aware that there might be issues in copying the email IDs from the chat, but there will be an email that, that, that will go out to all the attendees later on, which will include all your details. So if anyone has questions for either Patrick or Charles, please, uh, you can email them directly. We do have a question that's just come in and we have about two minutes to answer this. So I'll, I'll read it out aloud, uh, Charles and Patrick, see if you can answer this. Uh, so the question is, so basically, if there are concurrent proceedings in China and elsewhere, including Hong Kong, the public policy may stop the enforcement of the overseas proceedings in China. That's a question. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, let me briefly answer this question that uh, under Chinese arbitration uh, regime, uh, there is a declaratory relief on the, on the validity of arbitration agreement. And there are four courts have uh, such jurisdiction. The first one is uh, the claimants, uh, the, the, the courts of the uh, claimant's re uh, residence. And the second one is the, the courts of respondent's residence. And the third one is uh, the courts uh, where the, the arbitral, arbitral institution is located. And the first one is where the arbitration, uh, the court where the arbitration uh, agreement has been entered into. So uh, the parties can choose uh, uh, before or after the arbitral proceedings have, uh, have begun uh, to confirm or to invalidate or to declare the, the, the arbitral agreement invalid before the one of the four courts. So uh, if, if two parties have entered into an agreement, for example, uh, Hong Kong seated arbitration, either HKIC or ICC, then one of the parties is entitled to choose any one of the four party, four, four courts uh, asking for a declar declaratory relief. Uh, once that declaratory relief has been made, then uh, that decision will have res judicata effect. And so the any award, any overseas award rendered afterwards will be banned, will be, uh, will be denied enforcement, denied recognition and enforcement. So it wholly depends on 
the Chinese, of course, uh, uh, the willingness uh, to uh, to enforce uh, to uh, to enforce the treaty obligations undertaken under the New York Convention, and uh, because China is basically is a pro arbitration regime, and uh, Chinese, of course, have a sound record of uh, enforcing treaty obligations under the New York Convention. So that type of uh, non-enforcement will be extremely rare. Uh, thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much for answering that question, Patrick. Again, uh, thank you very much, Charles and Patrick, for taking out the time and uh, hosting this presentation and to Link's Law Firm for being one of our co-hosts. Um, I see we've got another question. Actually, just thanks from the pre previous uh, question and uh, ask up. Again, thank you very much. And uh, we will be closing this web, uh, this uh, event very shortly. I've got a few more things to mention uh, and some updates. So Patrick and Charles, if you'd like to now close your webcam and also stop sharing your screen. Thank you so much. <laughs>